Well, welcome to everyone, and uh, very glad to be here and very happy to have as our guest in this uh, uh, Getting to Know You interview, Mary Jane Stolfi, whom I have known for a number of years, uh, ever since I first came to Good Shepherd. Good Shepherd. And you were one of the, shall we say, the welcoming uh, the welcoming committee. <laughs> yes. You along with uh, your late husband, Bob. Yes. So, and they were uh, stalwarts at uh, uh, 5.30 Saturday, Saturday evening mass, and then uh, also during the week. 6.30. 6.30 a.m., the Dawn Patrol. Dawn Patrol. Father, oh. Father... Um, George. George's. Father George's famous Dawn Patrol. So the 6.30 Mass, uh, daily Mass during the week. So going back a few years, um, what happened on November 16th, 1934 in, it was actually a hospital in Easter, Pennsylvania. Easton. Easton, I'm Easton. sorry, see what I mean? I know. Easton, Pennsylvania. I was born. <laughs> okay. A baby girl came into the world. But your hometown, where you grew up, was Hampton. Hampton, New Jersey. It was, and I was informed of who I was very early by my mother and my grandmother, um, because my mother told me that I was a few weeks old when our parish priest came to her and said, "Mary, I would like to consecrate your baby to Our Lady." And my mother was alarmed, but she said, okay. So at a few weeks old, I was consecrated to Our Lady. And uh, later on, uh, well, actually, do you have a note? I have no, remember, can't remember what I was starting to say about the uh, uh, consecration. consecration. And after, after that, uh, I was in church because my grandmother used to go to daily mass and she would say the stations in the afternoon and then she would go to a friend's house and have tea. And if I were awake from my nap, she would stop at my house and take me with her to say to the stations. So this one day she heard my voice and she looked around and I was standing up at the altar. So she ran up to hear me, she heard me saying, I have, a, my dolly has ascendicitis of the ankle, and you fix her right now. Do you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> and so they told me, and I figured out at that time, at age three, my obligation was to tell God what to do and to do it right away. <laughs> So was your dolly fixed? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure. Okay. And uh, you made your first communion. and uh, That was another experience. My mother, uh, I was six when I made my first communion. We did it early in those days. And um, I was not interested terribly, but I looked at the, pic the girls in my class they all had beautiful dresses on with flowers and, and way, uh, you know, veil. Uh -huh. And I had a simple white dress and a very simple little veil. And I was so upset with my mother. And I said to her mother, why didn't I have a pretty dress? And she said, because you had good taste. <laughs> <laughs> because what? Because you had good taste. <laughs> she picked it out, which is what her remark mm -hmm. was. Um, so, um, you went to Catholic school, right? Yes. My father wanted me to go to, uh, I went to public grammar school, and my father oh. wanted me to go to a public high school, and my mother wanted me to go to a Catholic high school, which is where she went. And they were having, apparently, a great tug of war over this, because one night I was sound asleep, and my father got me and brought me into the living room and told me that they were having an argument and explained why. My father was afraid that if I went to a Catholic school, I would lose my brains. 
I would, I would not be able to make up my own mind. And my mother wanted me to go where she went to school. And so I had to make a choice. And I, that was my first experience of, of really being a little panicked over making a mistake. And I said, okay, I'll go, to, I'll go to Catholic school. So I went to Catholic high school. And your father eventually was okay with that? He was okay with that. He was okay with that. And uh, college? In college, I went away to school, but my, I had started going to daily mass when I was 12. Um, my mother thought we were old enough because she went to daily mass. And my mother was upset because she was afraid I would not be able to go to daily mass. So she had my father give me, make sure I had a car to take to college with me so I could go to daily mass. <laughs> then, um, it's no surprise that in my junior year of college, um, the school had a program with the experiment in international living, and they awarded two people to go to Europe for the summer. You leave, left in June and came back in September. And for some reason, they awarded me the award. And you got to choose your company, your country. So I went uh, to the, to, uh, on a boat for 10 days. We got to Europe. I spent the summer in Germany and, and Switzerland and uh, Amsterdam. The problem was that when I came back, the Andrea Doria had just sunk. So my parents were very worried about my coming back on the boat. Uh, the other thing that happened there is that in high school, in those days, you took Latin. I had four years of Latin, two years of French. And when the boy, the, in the experiment, the pet host family you stay with, they have of someone your own age to be the companion on the boat, on the trips that you took. And he didn't speak English, very good English. I didn't speak any German. My French was always terrible. And so we ended up speaking in Latin for the first three weeks. <laughs> oh, my. That, that's what my Catholic education did. Okay. And then a handsome Italian gentleman came into your life. <laughs> yes. My uncle worked for CBS, and they had a mail room. And my, uh, this young man came, started delivering my uncle the mail. And they struck up a friendship. And my uncle um, was transferred, or transferred, took a job with Notre Dame um, to set up the new WNDU TV station in South Bend, Indiana. And he, Bob, at that time, had already moved into production. And he invited Bob to go with him to set up the television station. So they went out to South Bend. And my senior year, I met the last three months of my uh, experience talking to a a priest, because I think I was thinking of going into the into the nuns, and uh, my mother would have been delighted, but I I wasn't sure, and I was sort of apprehensive about going to accept a job setting up a new library, because uh, I had a an English major, and a, actually my merger was in English and dating, and the other part of it was a a, a um, library science minor and I took a job to set up the library in a new high school but my I was really concerned I was struggling wasn't I I was struggling and so my mother said I want you to go out to South Bend so I went out to South Bend to stay with my aunt and uncle and the first night I was there they invited somebody named Bob Stolfi for dinner and <laughs> and um, so we, um, we met, played bridge that evening, and the next day he invited my aunt and uncle and me to go out for dinner. So I went to the restaurant with him, and um, I was mortified because he asked the waitress to card me. <laughs> he was nine years older than I was, and it was very insulting to be carded. So we came home, I got out of the car, want to go into the house, and he said, I'm going to marry you. And I laughed. And six, well, following year we were married at Notre Dame. 
we got the Bob arranged to have the Morrow Seminary Choir sing for our wedding, mm. and Father Hesburgh gave permission for us to be married at Sacred Heart, and Father J uh, Jerry uh, Wilson uh, prepared me for this, and uh, many years later, many many years later, I had a letter from him. I was out here. And he said, Mary Jane, I've always wondered, did I do the right thing by advising you to marry instead of going to the convent? And I said, I think so. I wrote to him. You think so? I think so. Oh, okay. I know so. <laughs> okay. That was 1958, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Bob was always in, always in TV. Yes. He went from... Um, being at WNDU, CBS wanted him back, so they hired him and sent him to Chicago. And so the first year that we were married, we lived in Chicago for a year. And then he was brought back to um, CBS in New York. And we were there and bought our first house. We were there for four years, I think, three or four years. And he was transferred to Los Angeles. So we moved out here. And um, that was in 1964 or 65, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were there, after two years, um, I had sort of succumbed to the, uh, the celebrities that are out here because I spent a lot of time um, at entertaining clients, uh, going out for dinner. I. I knew Chasen's and all those restaurants that you all, t you know, take people to. So and you became the hostess with the most. <laughs> hostess with the most. <laughs> then we adopted a baby girl, uh, and from and then we were transferred. Uh, when she was a year old, we were transferred back to New York, CBS in New York, and my husband was made vice president of CBS, and he was in charge of late night daytime, and sports. And from then on, it was 14 years of total immersion in CBS as a corporate wife. You know, I went to the Open, the Tennis Open in Forest Hills, all the Super Bowls, all the tennis things, all the Merv Griffin shows, all those things, which we did. But the... Uh, and it was fun. It was fun. It was, it was okay. Fun. You, yeah, were, it you was, were okay with it. I was okay with it. And uh, you adopted and we another went, boy. We boy. adopted another boy. Not another boy, a boy. A boy. A boy yeah. When we moved uh, back uh, from California. And then you came back to L.A. Then he, he was at CBS and he decided, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. Your Notre Dame cup there. My Notre Dame cup, yes, yeah, someone gave this to us. Our... Uh, Everything was fine, except that he was in New York having a physical, and he passed out. And they called the ambulance and took him, and he was diagnosed with AFib. And um, he was pretty shook, taken up by it. And he kept constantly taking his pulse, and his cousin, who was a doctor, said, stop taking your pulse. But I knew he was concerned. And now about a year later, he resigned from CBS because he'd started in production, he wanted to go back into production as a producer. And he produced um, three or four films, and then um, he had an opportunity to join a man who had brought from London, had brought uh, Three's Company, and he had other properties he wanted to put on television. So Bob developed them for him. One was Too Close for Comfort with Ted Knight, and the other were some movies and a short series, and a number of pilots. Then Bob retired when? He retired when he was 75. Well, you know, he, don't, yeah. he didn't really retire. They retire you. I mean, the business retires you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, had moved, we, had, we had lived in Hancock Park for a few years while our children were in school. And then we moved uh, to Beverly Hills, sold our house and moved to Beverly Hills. And uh, I'm trying to think. I can't quite remember how long 
because we I, when we moved to Beverly Hills was in the 70s, I believe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 70s or 80s. So now even with the AFib and being diagnosed with a heart problem, he lived until he was in his 90s, 91. Right? 91. 91 when so, he died, yeah. yes. Well, he had and that more. was only, what, a few years ago? No, it was two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Two years ago on the 16th of this mm -hmm. month. Uh, and I know one thing I didn't I didn't cover um, before he retired uh, he was uh, working with Gerald McRaney and they had major dad and he was he made several movies that he developed and, and uh, exec, executive produced for Gerald McRaney and he was ha operated on for <coughs> prostate cancer but he recovered and then he, he retired in a, you know, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then while he was retired, father asked me what did he do, and I said basically he's tried to write a book because during the Second World War he was a uh, ball turret gunner on a B-17. And he'd had many adventures. It was the first time they bombed Berlin from Italy was with his, his unit. And he had a lot of stories mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Now, your life as a corporate wife in the entertainment industry with CBS is one thing, but simultaneously your spiritual life has been, um, how would I say, a very deep um, uh, passion for you. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your spirituality through the years. I mean, you got, you got this start uh, when you were first born of being consecrated to Mary. I guess it stuck. It did. And uh, I don't uh, know if any of them are avail aware of the Jansenist development in the Catholic Church. It was a very strict and very heavy on the guilt side. And when we moved back east the first time, I went to the priest in confession. In those days, they had uh, didn't have doors. They had cur curtains over the, the confession. And I was in the confessional, and the priest, I had never met the priest before. He was in the parish where we went. And he said, what are you, some kind of a religious nut? Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that wasn't my, very nice. That was, that was my introduction to uh, a non-protected environment mm -hmm. <laughs> of, with my spirituality, mm -hmm. and uh, I began then to teach CCD, which used to be called Catechism. And actually, I taught CCD for twenty-three years, um, mostly el um, small children. I think the oldest group I had was uh, third grade. And then, then, well, what happened? Um, we were transferred, as I said, back to California. And before we came back to California, uh, I was, I had been in the junior league, and I don't know if you know, but when you finish, you're put out to pasture when you're 40. Uh, they consider you trained to sit on boards. And I was already on so many boards, I didn't really need another one. And... I was at sea. I didn't know what to do. I had all this time on my hands. I was a daily communicant, but I used to go over to the library and I would go to all the theology books and philosophy books. And I would, while well, the kids were in school, I would study and read and read and read about this transcendental meditation and every conceivable, what, mm -hmm. history. Um, and I was at sea. I didn't really quite know what what to ha what was going to happen to me and what I should do. Uh, and when we came back to California, the we couldn't find a house to buy because my daughter was in Hancock Park. We eventually bought in Hancock Park, but for the first year we uh, lived in Westwood, right near UCLA. And I went to the bookstore there, and I was going like this across the volumes, and I was a stab in my heart. I thought I was going to fall apart. It was the worst pain of my life. And I looked up, and my finger was on St. 
Teresa of Avila. I had never read her. So I then bought the books and started with St. Teresa. And she had a great influence on me because I liked her sense of humor. She's the one who said uh, to God, if this is the way you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few. <laughs> As she was knocked off her horse. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, from there, I don't know what I did. Well, Thomas Merton had an oh, yeah. influence on you also. Yes, he did. That was from Bob, because when Bob and my uncle were together, they went to Gethsemane <coughs> regularly for a retreat. Gethsemane is the Trappist Monastery where Thomas Merton was. Right. And in so Kentucky. In yeah. Kentucky. He brought me the book Seeds of Contemplation, which is one of the first books that Thomas Merton wrote. And I ate it up. I loved it. And I got his bio autobiography, uh, Seven Story Mountain. And I, I really was being slowly, God's will, introduced to contemplation. I mean, I was being active and talking about religion, but the contemplation takes time. And Seven Story Mountain is still a popular book in print uh, that you hear about and read about uh, still quite a bit. He, you know, Merton, Thomas Merton is still a very influential Catholic thinker mm -hmm. uh, in, in the United States. He died actually the year I was ordained, 1968. Oh, really? yeah. oh. And uh, he was uh, at a he was a Trappist monk, but he was a, at a conference in Bangkok, I believe, yes. uh, on monastic, Eastern and Western monasticism. And he was electrocuted by a faulty fan in his, in his uh, hotel room. Mm -hmm. But a uh, uh, very kind of a, a towering giant and one of, one of my spiritual uh, influences also, I think, in my yes, life. Yes, and he kept growing all through his ministry because at the, towards the end of his life, he rewrote Seeds of Contemplation because he, was, he had learned so much more uh, about our Lord and about the Trinity and about um, the spiritual life that he, was, uh, it, he went, wanted to rewrite it, mm -hmm. which he did. I he, didn't. he was one of the pioneers, actually, in the in the Catholic Church for uh, openness to the contributions of non-Christian religions to a um, to spirituality and to a spiritual life. You know, I, I would say he he was he he was the forerunner of the attitude that truth is truth wherever you find it. Mm -hmm. And also, um, he was responsible for me to understanding something that happened to me when we were. It, living in New York, but we had gone on business to London, and I was in London for a week, and then we went to Cannes for the the uh, festival or whatever they had. Mm -hmm. And while I was in London, I was sleeping, and all of a sudden, I was free. I mean, free like I can't imagine describing it. And I was flying through the air, and there's bright light came yeah. towards me, kept coming towards me. And I've never experienced such freedom. And I woke up and I said, I must have died. And I went to move and I couldn't move. So I thought, don't panic. Bob was still asleep alongside me. I said, don't move. So I tried moving my toe and finally I could move my big toe. It took me half an hour going all the way up my body to the point where I could move my entire body. And I realized, this is later when I was reading other books, I realized what had happened. They call it an out-of-body experience. It's not that rare, but it does happen. And it just, that sense of freedom with God was so acute, it really formulated me in terms of, of strengthening my commitment to trying to serve God. And uh, I became very involved with senior citizens. And I was eventually um, an administrator to the, I mean, an advisor to the mayor of our little village on senior citizens. And I uh, 
in fact, when I left, they put the Mary Jane Stolfi day on in September, mm. and because I, they were, they finally allowed Section Eight housing to come in to this little village, mm. and I was very pleased about that. But it put me more aware of trying to do something in community for our Lord. Mm-hmm. Very good. And that, uh, and Good Shepherd, you had some significant mm. activities. Uh, yes. are in relation to the church and spirituality. Yes. yes. I became a Eucharistic minister. Ethel, as a matter of fact, trained me to be a Eucharistic minister. And uh, then I became a lector. And a member of the uh, book discussion group. Yes. And then they started, the father started a spiritual reading group. And there were like six of us. And it is now up to 26 people, and we meet every other Saturday. And when I moved to Nazareth House, I gave it up. But about two months later, um, I, the, a young woman called me, and she said, We miss you so desperately. Can I come and get you? And she comes every other Saturday and gets me and takes me to Good Shepherd for our meeting. Uh, and we have gone, we have grown. We now really attack um, hypocrisy in our discussions of what, you know, life has been like. Uh, we, we talk about all kinds of personal uh, spiritual growth because what we do is we read a book and then we take turns reading aloud and then we comment each time Father has a stop and we comment on that particular format of the reading. And it's amazing what's happened in terms of the growth that we have. It's, it's wonderful. Maybe there would be a good chance to start it here. <laughs> well, if, if people are interested. See, if, see if, if you're interested, talk to Mary Jane. Well, what's the favorite book that of, of all of them while you were in that spiritual reading group? What was your favorite book? My favorite book was the. Remember Pope John the Twenty Third. Well, he had wrote an autobiography, mm-hmm. and I was going through a difficult time after Bob's diagnosis with, uh, can- with cancer, and I had his book, and I just ate it, and I kept reading it over and over and over again. Such a simple, simple priest, but so beautiful in his concept of Christ. It was just... Now, that was Journal of a Soul? Journal of a Soul, Mm -hmm. yes. It's a very simple book. It's not complicated. It's not heavy on theology. But the spirit of this piety of this man, when you're going through a difficult time in your life, uh, is wonderful. If if everyone across, I don't know if it's still in in print or not, but it's called Journal of a Soul. I think it is. Is it still in print? I have a copy if anyone wants to borrow it. Okay. Oh, that's great. But, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, and what are they? What are you currently reading? Currently, I am rereading *Mere Christianity*, which Richard recommended to me, and I am finding myself annoyed at the fact that I forgot so much of it. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be rereading it. Uh, it's by C.S. Lewis, uh, who is famous for the uh, Narnia series for the for children. And actually, the reason I found C.S. Lewis had to do with my daughter. She was reading uh, one of the Narnia books, and she wanted me to read it. So I read it, and I liked it so much um, that I started reading his, his regular books. And I read, mo- I read all of his books, but I l- had read Me- Mere Christianity and forgotten a lot of it. So that's another book that's in- very interesting. Um, C.S. Lewis... I was a professor at uh, Cambridge or Oxford. I think it was Cambridge, wasn't it? Yeah, no, Oxford. I one don't. of the one of the two of the colleges. Um, anyway, he's a wonderful person to read, also. And he was good friends with uh, Tolkien. Yes, yes, he was. Who was the science fiction writer, basically? I guess you can call mm-hmm. it science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, 
it actually is that time that you were really, really looking forward to. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, Sorry. You've kind of, and you've kind of gotten to the end of your life. What 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 are some of the parting parting shots, parting things that you would like to um, share with? with I would friend? like to share with one thing. I do not like being a widow. I really don't. And I know in the scripture it always says, God always says, take care of the widows. So any of you who are also widows, he's going to take care of us. We have to remember that. And then I don't like... I don't like giving up my car and giving up my house, my not my house, my apartment. Um, and then I found out that I had wonderful opportunity here to go to daily mass, which is really why I'm here and not some other place. I started to fall and I fell and fell and fell and fell until I had to go someplace where I was comforted if I fell. So I came to Nazareth house because I remembered that Bob and I had looked at it about four years earlier, but decided we were not ready for that. So we just continued living outside of it. So this is when I came, and they had the last apartment available was for me, so I took it. And I've been here now six months. Um, but I would like to share with you, um, because I've learned that most of us are here because we need healing. And I don't know whether it's spiritual or physical or emotional. Um, I wanted to share this with you. I love the Sacred Heart Fathers. And I want to read this to you. Lord, you invite all who are burdened to come to you. Allow your healing hand to heal me. Touch my soul with your compassion for others. Touch my heart with your courage and infinite love for all. Touch my mind with your wisdom, that my mouth may always proclaim your praise. Teach me to reach out to you in my need, and help me lead others to you by my example. Most loving heart of Jesus, bring me health in body and spirit, so that I may serve you with all my strength. Touch gently this life which you have created. And I just wanted to share Amen. that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.